Amen. Trust that what a great, really a great prayer of our hearts. Because sometimes we want to know the word, the written. Sometimes it doesn't lead us to know the word, the living. And uh, may that never be true of us. May we always want to know the living word as much or more than the written word. So if you have your Bible open to the book of Ephesians, we only have three more weeks. This week, next week, and the following week, the 31st, that I'll be saying that on a regular basis. Open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. And everybody, all God's people said, oh, see, I knew that's how you felt. Um, but um, I trust that you've learned a thing or two in the book of Ephesians, not just, again, for factual information, but really a way that has brought you into the spiritual blessings that we began with in chapter 1. That as we've looked through this book, that there has been a few things at least that have stuck out in your, in your thinking and in, in that God has used in your life. I trust that even uh, the more these uh, messages just here of late talking about the spiritual battle we're in and all the armor and all of that might be helpful. But we come to the end of the book. You know, I know that probably all of you follow me on my blog, so I probably don't have to even mention this, but some of you may have missed it this week, and so uh, I, I, this week as I was uh, preparing, I, the, the Lord brought a thought across my mind, and I thought how, how appropriate it was, at least in my thinking. Now, those of you that are sinners and go to movie theaters and, and watch the movies, um, you probably buy your popcorn about midway. I don't, do they even have an intermission anymore? Don't, even, don't shake your head yes or no, then I won't know that you go. But anyway, um, so uh, anyway, but you go there and you go get your popcorn and, and then the last scene comes on, right? And it says, the end. And you go, okay, got to get up, got to go, get your stuff, and you start. And what's rolling on the screen? All the credits. All the people it took to make the movie. All those people that wish you would stay for five minutes so you could go, oh, look, Bill Smith was the, was the uh, guy that held the microphone, or Sam Spade was whatever. You know what I'm saying? But no, no, you get up, you leave, those of us that watch things in the, in the secrecy of our home, DVDs and so on, I turn it off when it says the end. What do I care about all those people that did all that? The only time it matters, the only time it matters is if I know somebody's name that's up there. Now Josh and Holly knew a guy down south whose name appears on some of the Disney animated films. Some of you have been out to see, I think it's the Plains movie. Don't shake your head yes or no, then I won't think evil of you. But anyway, you've probably gone to see the Plains. It's not on DVD yet, so I haven't seen it. So anyway, my point is, is that right at the beginning of those uh, credits is a guy by the name of Chris Sonnenberg. He was one of the main animators of that. There's his name right there in lights. Now, Josh would wait until he saw Chris Sonnenberg's name before he got up to leave. But most of you would get up and leave. You don't care who Chris Sonnenberg is. And I think that's like the end of Paul's epistles. Paul comes to the end of every epistle, almost every epistle, and he begins to name names. There are not any of the names, now this is going to be shocking, I know, hang on. There's not one name at the end of any epistle that any of us know personally. Isn't that great to know? None of us are that old, okay? Now, some of the names are more familiar than others. Some of them, that's the one and only time they ever get their name mentioned. And, but the problem is, the epistle didn't end at verse 20. If Paul wanted the epistle to end by saying, pray for me that I may be an ambassador in chains and proclaim that I may do it boldly so that I ought to speak. If he wanted to end the epistle there, he would have. But he didn't. He continued on, and what he says in the next four verses are as important as everything he has said before. Obviously, in the beginning is the salutation, and in the end is his benediction, as it were, or his conclusion. In the beginning, he normally says who helped him write the epistle, at the end, he mentions people that are maybe connected to that church, or like we'll find out here, the guy that was his 
amanuensis. I love that word because we don't ever use it in our term. All it means is it was his secretary. It was the guy that took his dictation as he gave the epistle. So let's read verses 21 to 24 and just begin to look at the end, the conclusion of the matter. But that you may also know about my circumstance, how I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know about us, and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren, and love from the, with the faith, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all of those who love our Lord with an, in, an incorruptible love. Now, before I begin to look at some names, because that's what I want to do today, I want us to make sure that we're setting ourselves back in the first century. We just read, he said, Paul said, I'm going to send him to you so that you may know about me. If you and I today, like my conversations with our missionaries, almost always is through email, right? I mean, I sit at my desk or wherever I'm at, I sit, I open up my email account, I send an email, I hit send, and you know, within a millisecond, it's in their inbox. Now, they may not look at it for a day or two, or sometimes a week or more, but it's there. It's sitting there waiting for them. Now, I could call them. Now, with Skype and all the other kinds of uh, phone usages we have, I can call, and I do every now and again. Every now and again, I'll just pick up my phone because I've got Skype, it's very cheap, and I'll call one of our missionaries and I can have instant communication with them, okay? You need to remember something. Ephesians 6 was written before the days of email, before the days of instant communication, before the days of the jet airplane. The reason I say that is because I had to stop and I thought to myself, again, self, how long would it have taken Tychicus to make that journey? Now, if you remember, Ephesus is all the way over here in Asia Minor, right on the coast, but it's all the way on the western side of what we call Turkey today in Asia Minor, right? Now, if you were to take your handy-dandy map, which we won't do today, but if you were to take your handy-dandy map, over here is Asia Minor. If you would go across, you'd come to uh, Macedonia, then you'd go across a little further, another uh, 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 body of water, and you come to Italy. Then you have to go inland to the city of Rome. So I did my, I, I looked it up and I thought, I wonder what it would, how long that would take. What I found was, if I were to get on a boat from the, 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 from the, um, the dock, from the harbor in Ephesus, and take a ship to get to Rome, it would take approximately 20 days. 20 days. I mean, again, almost. let's just round it up and just say it would take me about a month to be able to get on a boat and get off in Rome. Now, that would still include some walking and, you know, getting myself there, and, and, uh, but it would take me about a month. Now, here's the biggest problem that I found with traveling by the ship. From what I found in a couple of different people, because I couldn't find it very much, but I found it in a couple of different authorities, they're authorities because they're on the internet. Anyway, it would cost about, get this, a year's wages for that, for that ticket. Now, I don't know about you, but if it cost me a year's wages to fly from here to Thailand, I wouldn't go. You know what I'm saying? I love those people a whole lot, but I'm not going to invest a year's salary to make a trip uh, over to see them. Tychicus, I don't know. It would be hard for me to think that he would invest a year's salary. Now, maybe he got on a ship and he worked it or whatever. There's other maybe possible scenarios. But more than likely, Tychicus probably walked. You will recall from any of your uh, study of the scriptures and Paul's journeys or even just what we know of Roman history, Roman, the, the Roman Empire was known for something extremely important for transportation. You remember what they were? The roads. Rome was known for roads. You can travel to 
areas over there. When we went to Albania with, with Vladimir, Vladimir used to tell me, and he never did it, and I, I've I've been bitter about it ever since, and now he can't take me at all, but he would say to me, one time when we're here in Tirana, we're going to go south to Apollonia, where the Aegean Way came across the, area, the country of Macedonia, and it ended at the, uh, at the uh, sea, but we never did, and the road is still there. You can, you can Google it if you want, and people that have been like to Turkey and places like that, there are still places where the Roman roads are still almost as good as they were the year they were built. Now I don't know about you, but that's pretty shocking because the roads that get built here are not as good as they are a day after they were built, okay? I mean, potholes and all the rest of it. And if you study Roman roads, you'll find that they had quite an engine, they were an engineering marvel the way they built them, okay? So if you, if you were Tychicus in Rome and you decided that you were going to travel to, to Ephesus via the Ignatian Way and the Appian Way, which was probably how you would do it, you would get yourself over there and you'd have to take a boat twice to go across the seas, but you would basically be walking. Are you ready for this? It could take you over three months travel. Three months! A lot could happen to Paul in Rome by the time they got to, uh, uh, by the time they got back to Ephesus. Some of us are old enough to remember the days pre-email, pre-fax, pre-really the, the good telephone use. You and I, some of us are old enough to remember when a missionary would type at their little hand typewriter. Ding, ding, ding. Sing, and then they would send you that letter and it would say, Pray for Bill. He has an abscessed tooth and he's not doing very well. Now, they sent that. Do you remember that? They'd send that mail and you'd get it like two months later. I mean, that was just normal if they were back in the bush, right? It could take two, three months. And you always wondered, I wonder how Bill's abscess is doing. And then the next letter would come in, letter would come in two months later, sorry, Bill died. You know, and you're like, I've been praying for his abscess, for crying out loud. I didn't know he died. It took that long just to get stuff around. Hey, when you read... Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait. Tychicus had to have gotten from Ephesus to Rome to begin with. He didn't live there. He was from Ephesus. So here's Tychicus. He had made the journey from Ephesus to Rome to meet up with Paul to tell him how the Ephesians were doing three months earlier when he left, to figure out how Paul was doing, so he could turn around, travel another three months or so, and get back home to Ephesus to tell him how he thought Paul was doing, when he, well, at least how he was doing when he left. I'm only telling you all that. You're probably sitting there going, what does it matter? It matters because I think it speaks to Tychicus. If I were to send you on a three-month walking journey... If I were to say to you, I want you to leave out of here, I want you to start walking from here to St. Louis. How many of you would do it? Show me your hands. Put your hands down. You would not. Nobody put their hand up. Good. Are you kidding me? Well, Pastor, can I stay in the hotel? No, you have to sleep in a tent at best. Maybe just out under the stars. You got to kind of take your own foods, fend for yourself, no in and out no McDonald's, no Burger King. You just have to head out. I mean, think about that. Why? Because there's a church in St. Louis, I want you to tell them how we're doing. Oh, and by the way, after you get there, you find out from them, you, you figure out how they're doing, then you make that same trip back to tell us how they're doing. Let's see, if you left today, let's just say you left September 1st, September, October, November, December, January, February. We'll see you in March. I mean, honestly, are you kidding me? That's what Tychicus did. I mean, this was a guy who was, when you read that, I've sent him to you, so don't go. Whoop. He left there in the morning and got there in the afternoon. Huh? It was a long trip. I mean, no wonder Tychicus makes it on the pages of Scripture. I mean, this guy, in fact, I want to go to a couple of places where he's mentioned. He's mentioned five times in the New Testament. So I want you to come with me to the book of Acts and chapter 20, okay? We're just going to, I need you to see a little bit about 
good old Tychicus. By the way, you too can say his name, Tychicus. It's kind of fun to say because you don't really get to say that very often. There aren't very many. I have never met a Tychicus, okay? I'm, I've never had a friend. I might have called him Tick, you know, for short. Um, but um, maybe that's where he ticks me off. Maybe that's where that came from. Oh, I doubt it. Thank you for that groan. I appreciate that. Um, you should never say things that just pop in your head. You know what I'm saying? You uh, should never do that. Anyway, Acts chapter 20. Paul, oh, wait. Chapter 19. Oh, where is he in chapter 19? Look at the heading on 19.1. Ephesus. Oh. And then you come to chapter 20. After the uproar. What uproar? The uproar Paul went through in Ephesus. When the uproar had ceased... Paul sent some of the disciples, and when he had exhorted them and taken leave of them, he left to go to Macedonia. And when he had gone through those districts, he had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece. And there he spent three months, and when a plot was formed against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return back through Macedonia. And he was accompanied by, let's take note of who he was accompanied by, Sopater from Berea, the son of Perthus, and by Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, who was also of Derby, and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia, probably Ephesus. Tychicus was already a companion of the Apostle Paul as he was ending his third missionary journey on his way back home. And there he was witnessing all of what Paul was doing. I think that's part of why, for Tychicus, he had a great desire to return back to see Paul in, in, in prison in Rome and then wanted to get back home to Ephesus to tell them how he was doing. Well, we, we won't stop there, but you could go see him in Colossians and the book of Titus and, of course, in our passage in Ephesians. But I want you to go to one other passage with Tychicus in mind, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul has been released and now has been rearrested. He has been taken back to Rome. He will die. 2 Timothy chapter 4, as it's been said many times, is Paul's swan song to, the, to his young uh, pastor um, trainee, uh, young Timothy, who Paul poured his life into. Timothy was still living in the city of Ephesus while this was being written. And Paul, at the end of this particular letter, begins to talk about a lot of people. Begin with me at verse 9. Paul said to Timothy, Make every effort to come to me soon, because Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. By the way, Dalmatia, another name for the, for the country of Dalmatia, currently is the country of... Albania. So again, this is Albania. Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful for me to the ministry. But Tychicus, I've sent to Ephesus. Now this isn't the same sending as we read in Ephesians 6, because these are separated by, oh, five to seven years, depending on the chronology of the life of the Apostle Paul, after he was released from his first Roman imprisonment. And I only point that out because Tychicus here was again remained faithful to Paul even at the end of Paul's life. I, I, I jotted down for myself six different words that could summarize the life of Tychicus. He was reliable. He was trustworthy. He was loyal. He was humble. He was servant-hearted. And one of the terms, the two terms that Paul uses in Ephesians 6 is, he said... The beloved brother, faithful. See, what I want to do today, and in just a minute we're going to turn to Romans 16, and we're going to walk down through a list of names that the Apostle Paul mentions. And I want, us to, I want you to ask yourself, what's your epitaph going to be? What are they going to write on your tombstone if they were to write something about your Christian walk? You know, back to those movie credits for a minute. Most of those people that come across those movie credits are certainly unknown to us. I would say 
unless it was somebody like Chris Sonnenberg or somebody. I mean, I don't know any of those people's names. I, I mean, maybe some of the names are familiar because you hear them, but I mean, I've never sat down to have coffee with any of them. And so I have a tendency to just ignore them. And for some of them, they're just, I mean, their role is so kind of minor in the work of the, of the uh, film, like holding a microphone or, or doing, you know, being a, uh, maybe moving the sets or something. But hey, if you didn't hold the microphone, they couldn't record it. If they didn't move the set pieces, it all looked like one thing. So everybody at the end on those credits was important. And so we're going to find it to be true of the names of the people that Paul mentions. That every one of them are important. They are unknown to us. They are unknown to history, most of them. Most of them are not like Tychicus who gets five notices in the New Testament. Most of them are mentioned once and then they're done. But Paul said he's the beloved brother and he's faithful to the Lord. It's the old story of the tortoise and the hare that you've heard many, many times since you were a child. I mean, who wins the race, the tortoise or the hare? Well, the tortoise, because the rabbit kind of gets himself off onto rabbit trails. He leaves the race, he, he doesn't pay attention, and finally that tortoise who just kind of plods along eventually wins. You know, folks, it's not about being a splash in the pan. It's not about somehow becoming super well known. It's just about being a plotter. God just calls us to be faithful. You know, there are so many names that you and I could look down in the history of Christianity. Names that, that were well known at one time. Names that were in the marquee as it were. Names that almost came out of nowhere then all of a sudden you don't hear about them anymore and if you do a little research you find out oh there's a reason because they walked away from God they walked away from ministry they they don't even they don't want anything to do with the Lord anymore Tychicus was not like that Tychicus was faithful to the end so I want you to turn with me if you would again to Romans chapter 16 again I understand that there have been a few times down through the years that we have stopped in Romans 16 so this isn't our first look at these names but again I think it's important for us to be reminded of these names what I'm gonna do I'm gonna do my best to not butcher every name but I want to read down through the first 16 verses and I want you to just follow there and so that in case I don't get the name pronounced exactly correct, you'll at least know, you'll see their name on the page of your scripture. Chapter 16, 1, Paul says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is in Sencrea, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of, for she herself has been a helper of many and of myself as well. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risk their life, as it were, their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Also greet the church that is in their house. Greet Epinetus, my beloved, who is the first convert to Christ from Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are outstanding among the apostles who were also in Christ before me. Greet Ampipolitus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Statius, my beloved. Greet Apellus, the approved in Christ. Greet those who are in the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my kinsman. Greet those of the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, workers in the Lord. Greet Persis, the beloved, who was also worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, a choice man in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobas, Hermas, and the brethren with them. Greet Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. 
You know, there were a couple of words that I would make sure that you notice in this passage. The first word that you need to make sure you notice is the word or its derivatives or at least the, the concept and that is the word worker. Isn't it interesting how often Paul said these were, peop these were people who worked. In most each of these occasions, on a number of them, it is a word that means and it's translated often they worked hard. They labored. They were the people who were always there when something needed to be done. We all know the 80-20 rule, right? 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. You know what I think? I think Paul had an 80-20 rule too. Because I don't think this is an exhaustive list of the people to whom he could have written. These are the people who worked hard. I've always found it interesting over the years how that every now and again people will actually voice it sometimes to me and sometimes I hear they voice it to others. Well, I never get mentioned from the pulpit. Why is he always talking about and then blank, whoever? Sometimes there's a reason. Because all you do is come and sit. And it's all these other people who work, work, work. Judy asked today for Awana workers. You know what? If you look at that list of people who work in Awana, most of them are doing a lot of other things other than just Tuesday night Awana. A lot of them are involved in Sunday school. A lot of them are involved in some other outreach. Some of them are involved in choir. Some of them are involved in Sunday. I mean, the, the thing is, if your name is not on that list, and all you do on two, you're a member of the church, and you can pass the the, 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 the background checks and we'll get you the CPP thing, the, the CPP uh, approval, okay? So assuming all those things are in place, if you're not doing anything else on Tuesday nights except sitting at home watching Tuesday night whatever, why don't you sign up and work? Oh, Pastor, you don't understand. <laughs> I am so busy. With what? I don't know, but I'm really busy. I want you to notice hard work. We're, oh, and men, pains me to say this, but I'd encourage you to go back through all these and find the women that are mentioned as the hard workers. It's not just the 21st century or the 20th century where the women seemed to do the work of the church and men just kind of backed off. It was true in Romans 16. A lot of these are women and it says they were hard workers. I mean, again, look at verse 6 just to pick one out. Mary, who has worked hard for you. Men, why do we seed off to the ladies the work of God as if we as men ought not to be involved. This list, hard workers, work, fellow workers, over workers, workers, workers. I like verse 10, greet Apelles, the approved in Christ. How was he approved? He was approved because he demonstrated that what he said was true. Belief means behavior. If you say you love the Lord, then I think you need to become a member of First Baptist Church and actively involved in the ministry somewhere. may not be Tuesday nights. Tuesday nights you may have a legitimate reason you can't be a part of it. That's okay. But there are other ways that you can serve. Again, in Paul's mentioning of some 30 names, it's worker work, labor. I mean, look again at Priscilla and Aquila. We meet them on the pages of Acts chapter 18. We could look at, we could look at Priscilla and Aquila, which we won't, but one thing, I, if there was a word I wrote down for myself that I would write on Priscilla and Aquila would be hospitable. They just opened their home. They had a church in their home. They had people in their home. 
I had someone say to me, I, I won't mention the name, but I had somebody say to me, hey, listen, we have, a, we have a spare room, and if there's ever a time you need somebody, you call on us, and we've got a room for a visiting speaker or whatever. Um, we have a need. Uh, I think we've got it covered right now, but, uh, well, I'll leave that go because I think we have it covered. But uh, my point is, is for Priscilla and Aquila, they were hospitable. They were industrious. They were willing to go out of their way. In fact, all the way to where in verse 4 it said, they risked their lives. When I was back reviewing these names, I, I, I talk about it all before, but I'll tell you, there's been some times that in some of the countries I've gotten to visit where I've been hosted in someone's home and I know that it was a risk for them to A, have an American in their presence and B, to have someone who was an American and a Christian. I know they put themselves at risk. I mean, I know that they had neighbors that were watching. But they were willing to risk their lives. I mean, that word just flows through this context there's another word that comes to my mind that was a word that Paul used of Tychicus. And it's the word beloved. Paul often uses that term in his writings. And here in, in Romans 16, and like I say in the Ephesians, he calls them my beloved. I mean, Priscilla and Aquila demonstrated their love, though the term wasn't used. Verse 8, and people... Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. So let me ask you a question. It was pretty obvious the Ephesians were concerned about Paul's situation. I think that's partly why Tychicus made that possibly three-month journey from Ephesus to Rome to find Paul and put himself at risk by finding him in his imprisonment and all the rest of it. And so they were concerned for him. And then Paul was concerned for the Ephesians that they understood that he was doing okay. He was doing okay. Four years of prison. No, ne not necessarily uh, expecting to be released. But I, he wanted him to go home and say, look, he's okay. Here's my question. Today... You don't have to make a three-month journey to find out how people are doing. How much do we care? Could be a phone call. Could be an email. Could be an old-fashioned letter. How much do we care? Back on the back in the, in the foyer every year, Shelly does a great job of changing that missionary board to to different missionaries every month and I wonder how many of us stop to look at it. Every month when you get your memo, now you get it digitally unless you've asked to continue to get it, um, you know, printed. But either way, the latter part of that memo are, are excerpts from the letters of our missionaries. Do you read them? Do you actually look at them and and try to find something in there that you could pray for? Tonight, Chris Brown will be here with us. And he's going to tell you all about some things that God is doing through Tech Partners. Wonderful stuff. He was telling me he, one of the, one of the benefits for him, he travels and with a couple of different groups that can go over into, into countries. And he goes over and he does all the video and all the... Um, the sound and all of that kind of stuff. But he always goes with multiple computers and multiple projectors. And you know what he does with it? He just gives it away. Here's a pastor that needs a computer. He gives them a computer. Here's a pastor that needs a video projector. He gives them that. He gives it all away. He told me this week he had a, he had a um, pastor in uh, northeast India write to him who uh, he had met a few years ago, gave him a computer that his computer died. It just, it just quit. And you know, there isn't like a, a repair shop around the corner. You understand that. And some of these computers are used in some pretty interesting situations, but it's dead. It's, it's, it, 
and again, it's not like he can send it in to Chris to repair it. So Chris is just going to send him, try to get him a new one. And, and I mean, even a new computer, you know, $500, $1,000. Folks, do you understand that's the blessing when you give to that missions fund? If I hear from a Chris Brown, I can say, hey, look, Chris, here's 500 bucks. He, I think he might tell you tonight, but one of the men from Bangladesh, we met him at the conference this year, the GRB conference, and it, on the way over from Bangladesh to the, to the national conference in, in Florida, his, his computer got stolen. He put it down, turned his head, looked back, and it was gone. So between Chris and, and us, we were able to help him get a new computer. I mean, do you, I mean I'm saying that simply to say... Those are real needs for real people. My question is, the Ephesians were really concerned. They were beloved to Paul, and Paul was beloved to them. And he was concerned, they were concerned about how he was doing. Again, it makes me ask myself, how much do I really care? About us locally? About the body of Christ globally? I praise God for our church. In those ways, we are very unique. Very unique. I said about the need today for Monic. Again, not to, I didn't plan to talk about that, but I mean, Monic's need is very real. He needs to get here. But if, if Hard House closes, oh, what, a, what a tragedy that would be. Because it just, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? I mean, Beth and Nicole have been there. I mean, it's a, it, you just go there and watch what they're doing. It would be wonderful if God could use this conference to help him figure out how to make it go. But again, he doesn't have a job where he has that kind of money. But we can help him. Paul wrote, and when he noted in, in Ephesians, by the way, isn't it interesting? In, in the book of Romans, it's about 30 names, give or take. We didn't even get all to them because over at verse 21 in Romans 16 it talks about Timothy and, and Jason and Sosipater and Tertius and Gaius and um, uh, Erastus and, and all the Cordus and a bunch of other names. You know the sad thing is in between verse 16 and verse 21 all the names that really meant something to Paul that were really his friends and helpers. Right in the middle of that he tells us about those who are enemies. Those who want to destroy unity. Those who are contrary to his teaching. There are always those kind of people too. But in the book of Ephesians, there's only one name that gets listed. I think it's kind of funny. Just one, just Tychicus. He didn't list out all those names of other people in the church at Ephesus. He didn't list out, about, he just, just, all he mentions is Tychicus. He said, he's my beloved brother, my minister in the Lord. He's going to make everything known to you. And for this very purpose, that you may know about us and that he may comfort your hearts. I want you to be set at ease when you know how we're doing. If, if you go home this afternoon, you'd like something to do for the afternoon, take that list in, in Romans 16. Take a commentary or a some kind of a study tool. For those of you that are computer literate, just get on your, go to uh, bibles.com or what, what's that, what's the Bible Gateway, something like that, and, and go look up some of those names. Most of them are Roman names. Some of them are Jewish names. But every one of those names, Paul knew them. I've told you this before and I'm going to end with this. I'll never forget, it was when we were in Visalia, I'd heard a lot of missionaries from the days we were in, you know, from the, from the days I started going to Magador Baptist Church to the days we were in seminary and Bible college to the days that we were in Sunnyvale and then Baker, Montana and Byron, Michigan. I mean, I heard a lot of missionaries, saw a lot of missionary presentations, sat through a lot of slideshows. <laughs> Remember those? Then the missionaries got really fancy and they had two or three slide projectors, you know, and they'd fade in and out, you know, and some of them were really fancy. I remember sitting through so many of them until a guy named James Morrissey came to Visalia. I don't know whether James was ever here. I don't think I've, I don't think since he's, I don't think I've been able to have him come. He, he's actually from just north. Like, um, oh, anyway, uh, he's from California. But God called him to go to Chile. 
Um, and uh, anyway, James came and he began to show us pictures and he said to us this. He said, um, I want you to pick up my burden for this country. I want you to feel just like I do. I want you to feel that burden. And I'll never forget thinking, I, I'm not sure I'd ever thought about it like that. But then it became very real to me. My first trip, 1997, when I came home with all my slides, before the days of digita, digital equipment in my hands at least, and I'll never forget, I put that first, that first slide up on the screen and it hit the screen, I'll never forget. I immediately knew what a missionary felt like. Because every picture I was going to show was real. They were real to me. They weren't just a name on a page. And I recognized for the first time by experience what it meant to sit and go, uh-huh, that's nice. Ooh, yep, mm -hmm. And going, that guy's real. And I know it's hard when you sit and you, I, I, I know it's hard. That's like when somebody comes up and says, hey, you want to see my family? Look at, and you go, oh, yeah, oh, well, I mean, that's not really, that's like my, I just picked something out of my pocket, okay? No, anyway, um, so, but you know, they pull, and now they pull out their phone. Look at that! And you go, yeah, that's, uh -huh, that's really nice. But it's really their family. You know what I'm saying? I, I want you to feel that Tychicus and Phoebe and Aplatus and Apelles and all these names weren't just names on a page. They weren't just the movie credits scrolling as the thing was coming to an end. They were real people who God used in miraculous ways. So how's he going to use you? What does he have planned for you to do in his work? He has something. He never saved any one of you to sit there in that pew and come to church and just go, that was another good sermon, now I can go home and feel good about myself. He saved you to serve. And it's up to you to find where that's at. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning because there were people before us, people who taught Sunday school, people who served as deacons, people who served as deaconesses, people who, who worked in kitchens, people who cleaned buildings, people who prayed, people who served in Awana. God, there were people all around us. I think back to my own life. I think of Mr. Keeling, who taught us in youth group at Magador. I think of Pastor Douglas, willing to work with a pretty, uh, not so mature, young teenager. I think of professors who left an impact in my life. I could make that list. Each one of us could. But God, make it that we would be on somebody else's list. Because we have invested in someone else. Call us, God. Call us to serve you as Tychicus seemed to from the pages of Scripture until he died. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.